So let's get started. There's a lot of acronyms that get thrown around when you're talking about Amazon Web Services like AWS. Uh, in this class, we're going to be using them, so I wanted to cover the key ones now. S3, Simple Storage Service. So that is the distributed, replicated, high availability, uh, key value store that Amazon provides and is the basis for any kind of persistent data when you're working with Elastic MapReduce. Now Elastic MapReduce, as I mentioned, actually uses servers that are part of Amazon's Elastic Compute Cloud, or EC2, which is the fundamental foundation of being able to get a server of the appropriate class provisioned with the software you need. And then finally, on top of that, you have Elastic MapReduce, which, as I mentioned, is Amazon's uh, system for automatically creating clusters of servers provisioned with Hadoop that you can use to run your jobs. So how do you actually interact with Amazon Web Service? Well, there's three ways. There's the first way, with, which is via a web browser, the AWS console. And that's what we're going to use for most of this class because you don't have to worry about things like uh, you know, what version of uh, Ruby do you have installed. Um, now, once you get beyond sort of learning how to use uh, AWS and Elastic MapReduce, then typically uh, you'll wind up using command line tools, and most commonly this Elastic MapReduce command line tool that is actually a Ruby script. And then finally, depending on your use case, if you need to, you can directly interact with uh, Amazon Web Services using the API, and they've got clients in Java, Python, Ruby, etc. Now, if you do want to start digging into the API and the command line tool, there's documentation available online in where else? aws.amazon.com slash documentation slash Elastic MapReduce. That's the point where you want to start from when you're finding out a lot of PDFs and HTML pages. So what's the first step? It's actually getting an account. All services require an account. Uh, the sign-up process is pretty straightforward. You go in there and you say, here's my you know, email address and password I want to use. Uh, it goes through this kind of interesting validation where you provide a phone number, they call you on the phone number, uh, you tell them what number you're seeing on the screen, and that way they know that it's a real person, or they hope it is, uh, with a telephone number that they can use. And end result is you wind up with an account. And accounts have these <coughs> uh, three, four-digit numbers that create an account ID. So let's go get an account. So we're going to go to the website, aws.amazon.com, and we're going to click the Sign Up Now button. All right, let's go sign up. So where do you sign up? Well, you go to aws.amazon.com. And they got a nice sign up now button that you click on. You're going to enter an email address like AWS test at scale unlimited. You say you're a new user. You sign in. So then it's going to ask you for your real name. And it's going to ask you for that email address again. And a password. And I'm going to grab a handy dandy password that none of you are going to be able to guess. And I've just created uh, an account, though it's still waiting for me to verify that I'm a real person and I've got the expected set of information. So I'm actually going to enter real stuff here. So you can see there's nothing up my sleeve. Uh, hmm, do I really want to do this? Let's just try that number there. And if I can actually figure out And now it wants credit card information. And that's, of course, to pay for any expenses that you incur when you're actually using AWS. So in this case, I think I might stop the recording right here and enter that and then resume after I've completed this phase. All right, I've entered my credit card information and now we're in the next phase of identity verification. And here it's asking me to provide a telephone number. It's gonna call me with a special pin code essentially and uh, ask me to enter that. So I'm gonna also do this offline. All right, I assume by now you've got an account. This account has a name, it's got an email address and a password, and it has a bunch of other attributes. 
beyond the account ID that we talked about previously. It's got an access key ID and sometimes you'll hear people talk about this as your public key but it's not a public private key it's just the less secret key. There's also a secret access key uh, and there's something called a canonical user ID and each of these has different uses. So what we're going to do now is we're going to switch back to the web browser so we can go take a look at all these different attributes of the account. Let's go take a look at all those bits of information we have about the account we just created. Here we are at the top level of the AWS console and it shows all of the different Amazon Web Services that we have access to. What we're interested in is the account menu that's over here at the top right. If I click here I can select security credentials. That's actually going to open a new window at aws-portal.amazon.com and here we can see information about the account. So one of the things is the account name followed by the account number and this was that series of uh, three series of four digits that I mentioned. Scrolling down you can see access keys. We have this access key ID right here which is public. If I clicked here it would actually pop up a little window that shows me the secret access key which I'm not going to reveal to you. Scrolling down you can see a little bit more information. Uh, here this is obviously the email address that we use to sign in that the account is really keyed off of and it has a password. And if we go down near the bottom once again you see the AWS account ID and then there's this canonical user ID which is what you use when you're controlling access to buckets and files in S3 and if you click on that it pops up a window where you can get access to this very long ID string. So we've got all these different settings for AWS, all these different credentials, but we need more. The issue is that in order to use Elastic MapReduce, we need an EC2 key pair. Once we have a real account, we can then ask Amazon to create a key pair for us. And these, this key pair is a classic public-private key pair. When you ask Amazon to create a key pair for you, it will save the public portion of the key pair with your account, and it will let you download the private portion of the key pair. You need this private portion of the key pair in order to log into an EC2 or Elastic MapReduce cluster. So how do we get a key pair? Well, you go back uh, to the Amazon Web Services console. You go to the EC2 section, not the EMR section. On the bottom left, there's going to be a link to key pairs. Once you click on that link, you're going to be in the key pair section of EC2 where you can actually click on a create key pair button. And from there, it's pretty straightforward to give it a name and you're done. So let's go ahead and do that. So if I click over here on EC2 and it just so happens to open up showing me my key pairs because I'd previously clicked on the key pairs link down here in the bottom left of the navigation pane. It's not showing any key pairs because I haven't created any yet. If I click on create key pair it'll let me enter a name for the key pair in this case I'm going to call it again AWS test and I'll click the create button. This generates a new key pair which means I've got both a public and a private key. The public key Amazon hangs on to and it's downloading now the private key this PEM file and yes I do want to save that because I will need it at various times. So now you can see that Amazon knows about this key pair called AWS test. There's one final step we need to do to set up to run a job, and that is we need to create an S3 bucket. So Elastic MapReduce uses S3 both as the source for your job and also as the destination for where it puts log files and where it assumes you're going to put your results. So S3 organizes all of its data in buckets. At the very top level in S3, you have some number of buckets. You're going to need to create a bucket that has directories for where you're going to put your job jar and where you're going to ask EMR to put the logs from the job and the results from the job. So let's go ahead and do that now. Once again, we start at the top level of the AWS console. And this time, we're going to click on the link to S3. And here it shows me a list of all the buckets that I've got defined in my account. Currently I have none. So I'm going to create a bucket. So I'm clicking on this create bucket link. And it asks me for a name. Now, as we mentioned, the bucket name has to be unique across all users. So if I go in here and I give it some 
common lame name like test and I try and create, I'm going to get an error that says this name is not available. Uh, as a note, you can see that I'm trying to create the bucket in a region, and the region selected here should match the region that I'm using to run my EMR jobs. I'm running in the US East region, so I'm going to use US Standard. And now to create a unique name, I'm going to call this AWS Test and my initials. So now I've got an AWS-Test-KK bucket over here on the left and it has nothing in it. So it's ready now to be used as a destination for Elastic MapReduce job output and also job, job logging. Excellent. We are now ready to run a Hadoop job. We've got everything we need. We have an, an account. That account has credentials. We've created a key pair and we've created the bucket we need. Now in the next module we're actually going to use all of that setup in order to run a custom Hadoop job.